Hello everyone, this is Julie from August Birdsong, and I'm here today with my design team journal for October for the Graphics Fairy, and I have made a nature journal focusing on um, three different movements in the 1800s. Uh, romanticism, transcendentalism, and naturalism. And I came to this because I, I wanted to make a nature journal, but I thought, what do I want to say about it? I, I like my art to kind of um, inform in a way, or at least get us thinking. And um, I was thinking about uh, people like, here's John Muir. He was from the later 1800s, founder of the Sierra Club and... Um, uh, also influencer of uh, presidents um, in order to get national parks and forests preserved. And people like John uh, Henry David uh, Thoreau and um, even, you know, William Wordsworth in the Romantic Movement or John Keats. What was it in the 1800s that drew them to write or paint or, you know, create music um, about nature. And uh, that's where I started my look. And as you can see, uh, here I have the cover. I found this beautiful scarlet um, cardinal. I think I found this particular one on the free blog. Um, images, but it, I, I'd need to check. It might be in one of the kits as well, in the bundles. And I've enlarged it as well as the porcupine just as part of the backdrop for John um, Muir's photograph. I used my old book pages like I am known for uh, as the frame for him, as well as other black and white elements like the camera and parts of the crossword puzzle here. Um, and this trellis work, just as a way to kind of tie the more colorful elements together with the black and white photo. And so I find black and white often helps sort of unite uh, various elements um, when more color might distract. Now, um, here you can see on the spine of this binder, this is an upcycled Better Homes and Gardens binder. Uh, I used a beautiful uh, nature printout from the ornithologist kit. And here you can see that printout. And you can see I used that central part mainly for the spine. And then I also used strips of it around the edges of my journal just to disguise its original color and uh, all. And then here on the back page, I have uh, put again another scene of nature with people enjoying it. And we have here some bicyclists and um, it's actually winter time and they're on some packed snow with their dogs and some children in the background. And I've again uh, included the animals and the greenery. I cut up some of this uh, larger winter greenery to make it fit. And I tried to create movement on the page. So you have some of the leaves heading this way. The light bulb is aimed that way. The car is going to the left, just like the rabbit. While our magpie here, one of my favorite birds uh, from the graphics fairy, uh, is facing to the right, along with the printing press and this car. And what that does is sort of just creates movement for the eye, moving through the page, um, and, you know, gives it some additional energy. So it doesn't look just necessarily flat. Now, notice uh, I have the light bulb and the cars and the printing press. Here's a ticket, like a train ticket, on here because a big part of of what this journal focuses in on is how the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s was influencing nature and the people living uh, through that time in history. So let's open up and here, uh, the inside page is where I have the title. Um, and I, I put nurturing nature and it's a little ambiguous intentionally because 
nature nurtures mankind. We turn to it um, often in the worst of times. Think of how many people wanted to go to the parks during COVID just to get out in the fresh air and feel like they were out and about when we were in lockdown. Uh, some people retreated to, you know, um, homes or places out in the country even um, just to get away from COVID in the cities. And it was the same at this time in the early 1800s, too. Uh, in the early 1800s, especially 1801, uh, one in seven Londoners had died from tuberculosis. And that was a horrible uh, respiratory disease. And uh, they, too, reverted to the country. And those who also suffered from it um, went to the country or tried to be outside as much as possible, enjoying nature. But they were there for the fresh air, which was part of the cure. Uh, for tuberculosis. So I'm starting with the romantic movement, romanticism from the early 1800s. And you might remember William Wordsworth, John Keats. Um, this is uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley. And uh, he wrote Ozyman Dias, if you remember, uh, King of Kings, um, his poem there on look at uh, on my creations and despair and so powerful, but it's all in runes. Um, solitude was a big theme about finding your own personal joy in nature by yourself. William uh, Wordsworth wrote a lot about that. But solitude was really important, too, because tuberculosis was incredibly uh, contagious. And the crowded cities, all the people coming there, uh, to work in the factories as those were evolving with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, they were, you know, adding to the spread of tuberculosis. So people who could afford it went to live in the country. Um, and many of them were artists or artists who had wealthy patrons as well. <clears throat> and so here we have, turning the page a little bit more from that period, this is Mary Shelley, uh, the author of Frankenstein. And you might think this is a nature journal. Why are we talking about Frankenstein? Well, she was married to Percy Bysshe Shelley that I just showed you his picture. And she actually uh, was with him uh, and Lord Byron, uh, at one point in 1816, when they had a writing contest. And the three of them, the, the contest was, let's see who can write the, the scariest horror story. Well, Lord Byron and Percy Bysshe Shelley, they never actually finished theirs. But Mary Shelley wrote, and she was only 18 years old, she wrote Frankenstein. And her ideas about it were the ideas if if man creates a machine or a monster, okay, think of at that time, Frankenstein, the creature. The doctor was actually Dr. Frankenstein. But if he creates that, what if it turns on him? What if this monster actually goes after the creator, okay, the doctor? And that's going to come up later as we talk more and more about the Industrial Revolution's impact on mankind. Um, here we have, again, just a page uh, focusing on the artist's disease, which was tuberculosis, also known as TB or consumption. And it was called the artist's disease because so many of them struggled uh, with tuberculosis. Among them, John Keats, uh, the Bronte sisters died from tuberculosis. Chopin died from tuberculosis, as did Robert Louis Stevenson. It was rampant in that community, as well as, like I said, uh, so many other people around London and uh, Europe and, and the world in general, and had been there for centuries. Uh, so at that time, what happened is people went to the country, to the solitude of nature and the fresh air to rest. 
and try to survive it. It was a slow killer in many cases. And at this time, Mary Shelley and, and her husband and Lord Byron were together. They didn't have tuberculosis, but they were together out in the country and, and part of the romantic movement. Well, they had uh, gone on a trip to be together and uh, were going to write this story. And the night uh, before writing it, Mary Shelley had had a dream. And I've used here this famous painting by John Henry Fuseli uh, to kind of describe it, the nightmare. And here there's a, a ghoul, a demon sitting on the sleeper. Well, her dream <clears throat> was a nightmare. And it's partly what inspired um her writing Frankenstein. And the dream was about bringing um, the dead back to life. Now, just a note on that idea, Mary Shelley of four children, four babies, only one survived. And at this time, she had also lost a baby and um, to death. And there was that pain of if I could bring the child back. And that was part of her psyche as she um, had this dream. And so she wrote Frankenstein. Now, I've put in the background here, uh, Robber of Youth. And on this page, page I had the artist's disease. Um, tuberculosis uh, was considered, ironically, for as, as big of a killer as it was, it was considered very sexy uh, in the artist world because people were thin and sickly and pale and a bit feverish looking. Uh, it was thought to inspire them and to kind of elevate their senses to a, a spiritual level. And that's how the Romantics um, kind of approached tuberculosis, is that it was heightening their senses to uh, enjoy nature more and capture it in their art. So here we have, uh, this is actually from uh, a little napkin that I decoupaged on there. And I have just put him on this with some lace and ribbon and cheesecloth. And there's a little mouse down here. And on this page, we have uh, some beads hanging off here, along with this beautiful um, bird. And here we have my squirrel, who I have actually, the way I created this page, I wanted him within the branches, the way we look at nature and peek in at it. And so what I did is I took an X-Acto knife and I cut a few little slits in the trunk of the tree and tucked some of these leaves in it at an angle and put some dimensional dots underneath them to lift them up to create that feeling of depth and so by using that exacto knife it just tilted them a little bit but at the time it was a little too much just brown and green so i brought in this beautiful uh flower and its smaller flower buds along with these are some of the dominoes from the stained glass uh kit and I just glossed them up and actually I cut them down just slightly into these little decorative squares along with this little bird stamp, uh, which is also um, in um, the Graphic Fairies bundles. And I just used them as accent color to bring a little bit of pop to the page. And so that's how I did that. And this is just... Um, uh, a stamp with paint of a, a raven in the background that I had in my stash. And so I put him down like he's hunting around looking for food. And the squirrel even, I put a little slit in his mouth so that nut, that acorn could just pop in there. So there you have it, uh, the romantic movement. Um, we'll be working uh, our way into naturalism soon. And first, though, we're going to talk about transcendentalism. 
and that I just realized this was just out of place a little so we'll be moving to this section next so moving on to transcendentalism uh, this was around, say, 1836, and uh, individuals like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau were greatly influenced by the Romantic movement, um, but also had uh, their own take on things, which we call transcendentalism. Uh, and so here, for this section, I actually made kind of a, a little... Um, uh, folder within this bigger journal and you can see I used that beautiful paper from the ornithologist again as the background uh, to the cover um, also on some I think this is this uh, is in the end paper set and then I just enlarged uh, this bird and as you saw other animals so they could be the stars of the nature journal all right, and so moving right along then, opening it up, we'll start uh, talking about Henry David Thoreau. Um, here we have, uh, again, this is a beautiful um, bird page, and I'm trying to remember if that's in, I think that's in this ornithologist set too. Yes, because you can see this background, it's like that. And this is one of the like printable, um, journaling pages and I just used half of it um, and the other half was on this page with um, the woman behind it I believe it's her and I just ended up covering her up to put Henry David Thoreau there but back to transcendentalism here I had a jelly print that uh, I had used a, a number of years ago it was a little house cabin stencil and this has just been sitting in my stash waiting to be used. And so I ended up tearing it down and, and just using it as um, Thoreau's uh, little cabin that he made uh, on the banks of um, Walden Pond. And that was actually uh, on the property of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And they were uh, close friends and, and kind of... Um, partners in this transcendentalist movement. Um, and so here you're going to start noticing that I'm bringing in technology that was growing at that time. Now, the 1830s, we didn't have the railroad yet, and I kind of forgot that when I put this page together. But um, we might have had some early steam uh, you know, steam cars of some kind. I'm not sure that we had th quite this, but Decide the point. Um, here we have, uh, you know, again, this mix of technology. And the transcendentalists really believed in kind of um, elevating oneself to take care of themselves. And like um, a strong individual could, you know, farm and feed the family or um, do minimal work if we didn't just crave material things. And so, you know, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity is one of the famous quotes of uh, Henry David Thoreau. And that if we live simply, um, we don't need as much. And, you know, this was directly in contrast to kind of the Industrial Revolution, which was about machines and mass production and, and, um, you know, taking the little local store to the level of the big city department store is what would eventually evolve out of it. And the transit, oops, something just fell. The transcendentalists believed that that was not the way to happiness and that um, man is much happier amidst nature and... Um, existing within it, again, in solitude to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, again, living, um, living for an ideal life uh, rather than the material things and the money and the work it takes to buy those material things. So here I just use, this is a real pretty little background 
um, tag from the graphics fairy. And I just use that to sort of represent the banks of uh, Walden Pond. And I mentioned Emerson that it was on his property, actually. And here's just a, a little nature scene uh, in winter. And here's some more of that ornithologist uh, uh, journaling paper. This is actually a napkin, this lovely little fox that I um, decoupaged onto this brown design piece of paper. It was just old scrapbook paper. Uh, and I've had him in my stash for a while. And I just thought this was a good home for him on here. Uh, down here is some more just basic collage with kind of nature. I have the little frog um, and on, you know, on uh, the log and the mushrooms and some pumpkins uh, and all. And here I've used those um, uh, stained glass windows. This is a circular one. It, it's just half of it, but you could have the full circle window by putting the two halves together. But again, I just love the colors and, and sort of the natural classic design of them to go with nature and especially this background um, end paper and all for this. And so continuing with the transcendentalists here, um, they looked at nature not as much in a romantic way, um, but in a, in a real um, ideal way that we're all creatures interacting together. And, um, and existing together. And so Henry David Thoreau went to Wald and he said to transact some business to see what, you know, if I could learn what life had to teach. That's sort of paraphrasing his larger quote. Um, he has a famous uh, line uh, where he says he had three chairs, one for solitude, two for company, or sorry, one for solitude, two for friendship, and three for company. Uh, he always left his door unlocked so that if he was out and a traveler came along through the woods, they could go in and rest uh, and all of that. Um, but again, he lived very simply. Um, pretty much he was often considered to be a vegetarian, um, possibly just eating, you know, just va very basic things. And again, that was part of that transcendence of the spirit. Um, it's thought that Mark Twain actually modeled Huckleberry Finn after uh, Henry David Thoreau. And um, that idea of self um reliance and ability to survive and to just exist at simple levels. Uh, here we have, this is from, I think, the Marsh Song Bundle. I've put one of the little frogs here on it, too, just to add some collage to it. And again, I, I had this tag in here more as representative of what might be at Walden Pond, um, you know, nature-wise and the birds and the grasses at the water level. Um, so here we have a turtle and then more of that stained glass um, uh, windows that I added to it just to pick up all the colors within um, the natural world. Right here, this is just a jelly print pocket um, that I made and I need to adjust my lamp here, sorry. Remember something fell earlier, and actually that's where it came from. So anyways, uh, this was just with a, a jelly print in the background um, texture stamp I had used, but I just liked kind of the, the earthiness and yet the cosmos feel of it. I think it's from a horoscope one. And so I used it just to be the murky waters uh, in there. And here, uh, a famous quote, all who wander are not lost. And that's from uh, the Graphics Fairy uh, collection of quotes as well. And so um, moving on into the later 1800s, uh, I ended this part not so much with the Transcendentalists, 
but uh, with Edith Holden, who many of junk of the junk journal community love using pages from her nature journals. And this was a little jelly print that I've had in my stash forever, along with this one too. And I just like the colors. This is some background. I actually printed it on fabric, but a background print from the graphics fairy with a butterfly on it. And I just felt like that sort of teal blue worked very well with it. And so here I just made a real simple little uh, binding. This could even be a bookmark, uh, but a binding to hold it together. And I put the little artist palette there um, because uh, Edith Holden was a, a nature artist and um, painter. And actually uh, her paintings and, and sketches drawings were also illustrations in um, children's books and other books at the time. So this little section we're looking at about the 1870s is sort of devoted to her. And so again, I kind of picked up the water image. I thought this reminded me of, of maybe again, you know, that idea of Walden Pond, even though we're not at Walden Pond. And then I just opened it and I put a little simple pocket in here. Um, Edith Holden would pot, you know, she's sort of in that in-between time, but probably more so from the naturalist period. Um, she was a, from a family, her father had a business and all, but they had a lot of ideals similar to transcendentalism. Um, kind of living ideally and simply and interacting with nature. Uh, there were many children and, and they all had some interest in the arts. Um, the sons off, you know, they ended up kind of with the family business, I think. But the girls were all interested in drawing and painting and um, being out among nature. They also did a lot of charitable work with children. So again, those were a lot of um, ideals of the transcendental movement. Um, and here, I just put this in there. She might have had a copy of Walden even by Henry David Thoreau. I don't know for sure, but I just thought that was cute to add that. And these are from a, a book of Edith Holden um, paintings, an old book I have, and I just cut those pages down, her nature diaries. And her paintings are more a little bit of the naturalist. So finally here we come to the naturalists, and this is where John Muir uh, comes in. And the naturalist movement uh, dealt more in reality and basing um, the art and writing um, and, pro you know, progress within the naturalist movement on facts and science and observation of what was real. Um, actually, uh, Audubon uh, even though he was from an earlier time, more of the Romantic period when he lived, he was more of a naturalist in his artwork, in showing you, you know, uh, what nature looks like. Um, even, you know, for example, when, say, uh, the fox is hunting or um, has, you know, has, has caught its prey. And so the naturalists... Um, dealt more in what do I see and what does it tell me. So here I did a collage with this beautiful um, deer and it's a, a bust of it and I just really enlarged it. So again it's the star of the page and worked in a bunch of greenery and just this little steampunk woman with her binoculars in the background because again we as humans we're just observing it we're just peering into nature to see how it it lives especially when it's not aware that we're there um here is just a a collage page this is a die cut i had made a while ago and i just had it in my stash and glued it down 
And this just focuses on John Muir, a little bit about his childhood. Uh, first, here's a, a photograph of John Muir. And I found um, the historical photos of, of these people uh, at the public domain. And um, there you have him. He lived from 1838 to 1914. And um, here, I just have these little boys representing his childhood. This is not a real photo of John Muir. It's from the Ancestor, Instant Ancestors bundle. But I, I thought it, it maybe it could have been him. It, it was a cute picture. Uh, John Muir actually was born in Scotland and lived there until he was about 11 when his father um, moved with him and his one sister. He had other siblings there still, but just the three of them uh, came to, I think it was Wisconsin, and started farming there. And his father was a very stern man, no time for play, only work. And um, he didn't even let uh, John Muir have time. He was very much an inventor at heart or a crafter in, like us. And uh, John Muir would get up at like um, one in the morning and work in the barn with his inventions um, during that time simply because it was the only time he had. So he was willing to sacrifice sleep if he could, you know, be out there inventing. And uh, he was very successful with it. And he could have probably become a very wealthy man, um, you know, with his abilities with like engineering and such. But he chose nature and to become an advocate for it and to speak for it. Here we have this beautiful page with this uh, uh, background of the leaves and when you open it, here you have, again, some forest scenes. He was concerned with the logging industry uh, and what he saw, you know, forests being cut down. Uh, he worried about, you know, a kind of a dead time where the forests would disappear and the creatures that lived in them. And here we have uh, the squirrel again. And he has a bunch of technology surrounding him. And uh, the birds are fleeing there in the stamp in the background. But John Muir looked at what he was observing. And that's what um, drove him to even seek out presidents. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, we'll get to him in a minute. But um, to become an advocate for trying to preserve wild places uh, for the public in general, for the children in future generations. So here I just have this image kind of of a traveler or a climber, a naturalist. Uh, and I, I just put these polar bears here. It's not realistic at all, but I felt they worked well. You know, here she is enjoying her climb and they're like, hey, this is our turf, you know, move on. I also put some little like crystally. Um, I'm not even sure what it is. You know, it's for crafting. I just put some clear glue beneath it and sprinkled them on to create that effect of ice. And then when you open it, we have kind of our, our steampunk lady is the busybody public moving into um, these wild places and the animals being chased out to a certain extent. And we have the light bulbs trailing the owl and his wings are caught in in that. And up here, this is a steampunk character as well. I call this his whirly gig. And he's up there with the birds flying around and looking at things. Um, but, you know, kind of what a crazy time the Industrial Revolution, you know, was just moving uh, so quickly with inventions. And that leads us here. Here's a, a graphic of uh, an early train model. And I have our, our tourists or our immigrants, our people on it, maybe moving west. And we have here a picture of John Muir with uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who was president at the time, 1903. And he brought him uh, 
to Yosemite. And he spoke with uh, Teddy Roosevelt about the need to preserve the land for future generations and, and for the animals and nature that lived there. And um, that's what happened then. We, we have John Muir, you know, behind so many of the places that people go camping and sightseeing and visiting um, those wild places that are still here, you know, over a hundred years later. So again, I just use this uh, famous painting of this beautiful girl and this lovely little bird and have a book page that says a rescue because that's kind of how John Muir approached life is rescuing the natural world before it was too late. And here we have, this is from the camping trip uh, bundle. And up here I've written uh, the Frankenstein myth because again, we mentioned Mary Shelley earlier, the author of Frankenstein. And the Frankenstein myth seemed to tie in well with this nature journal, with this idea of of man trying to find that balance between the machine and the living creatures, including mankind. And um, so I thought it was important there to include Mary Shelley as well with that. So the Frankenstein myth is normally kind of a science fiction term. And think of the movie Terminator, where the machine actually turns against the maker, the creator. Um, and in this case, machines might just be, you know, the general uh, technology out there, automobiles, whatever. But John Muir, uh, as a closure to this, you know, he hoped to, by preserving parts of land, um, to save some sacred places uh, and leave them untouched by too much progress. And so here I end with take only memories, leave only footprints, uh, and hopefully coexisting here, um, the nature amidst mankind with its progress. And the same could be said of, this, of the back page here. So again, I can't say enough, the Graphics Fairy has so many beautiful digital images and elements for you to create with, whether it's a card or a journal um, or, a, you know, um, um, something you want to hang on the wall, a, a, a creative picture. So check it out, and um, I hope you enjoyed this look at nature and kind of a historical take on the Nature Journal. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.